So what does a captain need to do? A captain should be familiar with all rules, schedules, policies, and procedures, and pass this information along to their team members. That way everybody's informed about what's going on. Captain should also assist the intramural sports staff with the implementation of the sportsmanship policy, a policy that we will go over later in this presentation. Teams are encouraged to arrive at least 15 minutes early to every contest. This allows the teams to warm up and to check out any equipment they might need and to start the game on time. Captains are also the representative for each member of the team. It is encouraged that team captains are the ones to discuss rule interpretations and calls with our student officials. Participants are encouraged to have a physical examination and obtain adequate insurance prior to participation in recreational sports activities. Individuals who participate in recreational sports activities will be doing so at their own risk. Participation in recreational sports is voluntary and the University of Southern Mississippi is not responsible for any injury that may occur to participants. Student health and accident insurance information may be obtained through Student Health Services at 601-266-5390. Concerning lost or stolen items, Southern Miss Recreational Sports assumes no responsibility for items that may be lost, stolen, or damaged during intramural activities. All students are encouraged to secure their valuables. If you are concerned about the security of your valuables, you may locate the sports supervisor on duty and he or she will attempt to locate a safe place for your belongings. There's a chance that during the fun and excitement of intramural sports, the recreational sports department may want to photograph and videotape participants and use those photographs and videos for promotional materials. If for some reason you choose not to be photographed or filmed, please notify the staff and we'll delete any of the pictures or videos that we have of you. As you're putting together your championship squad, you probably want to know who can play on it. Currently, all undergraduate and graduate students who are enrolled at the university are eligible to play. Faculty and staff are also eligible to play, granted they have purchased a rep card. Spouses of these eligible participants can also participate through the purchase of a rec card in co-rec leagues only. Spouses must be on the same roster. Many students ask, how many intramurals can I play? Well, the answer to that question is, you can play as many intramurals as you want. However, players can only compete for one single sex team and one co-reg team per sport. Players may not transfer from one team to another. There are some new changes this year to the ID policy in regards to checking in to an intramural event. Participants who appear on the IamLeagues.com team roster by noon of the day of their event may check into the intramural activity with any form of government picture ID. Participants who wish to check into the event but do not appear on the IamLeagues.com team roster must prevent their Southern Miss ID or rec card. All dodgeball games take place at the Payne Center on the gym courts. Some of you may be wondering, do I need to bring any equipment? The answer is no. Intramural sports will provide all equipment needed to play dodgeball. Here are some examples of legal and illegal equipment while playing dodgeball. We ask that all participants wear athletic attire while playing in the games. Please avoid casual clothing and no flip-flops, sandals, or other street shoes are allowed. Exposed jewelry of any kind is not to be worn during the game. Below are examples of items that intramural participants will not be allowed to wear during intramural activities. If you have a medical alert bracelet or medical alert necklace, please notify the intramural supervisor on staff and we will work with you to secure that item to either your wrist or to secure it to your chest. Here's an example of the playing surface that will be used for dodgeball. As you can see from the blue inbounds, basketball court lines will be what we consider inbounds for play. Outside the basketball court lines, indicated by the red on the diagram, will be out of bounds. Let's talk about team composition. When playing in a men's or women's leagues, teams will have a maximum of six players on the court and a minimum of four players on the court. When we get into our correct leagues, if a team chooses to play with six, three players must be male. And when they play with five, two must be female and three male, or three female and two male. When playing with four, teams will have to have two females and two males. 
teams must designate a team captain to communicate with intramural representatives in case we have any issues. Remember, a team includes all players and spectators. So how long do games typically last? Games are scheduled every half hour. Teams will be scheduled for two matches a night. The clock will run continuously for 25 minutes. There are no timeouts. Obviously, there will be exceptions made for an injury. And at the event of a tie, there will be a sudden death tiebreaker. Teams will return to the floor, each with six members. The first to eliminate any opponent wins. To start a game, the official shall have a captain's meeting before where he or she will remind the players of specific rules and clarification questions from captains. When we start play, three balls will be placed on both sides of the court at the volleyball 10-foot line. All team members must stand beyond the baseline on their side of the basketball court. When the whistle is blown, players are allowed to go anywhere on their side of the court but must stay in bounds. Once the game begins, all six balls are in play for both teams. Now let's talk about ways that players can be out in dodgeball. If at any time a player contacts the court across the center line, the player will be out. This is displayed by the diagram below. Contacting the center line is legal. Reaching over the center line to grab a ball, provided that the player never contacts any part of the court on the opponent's side of the center line, is also legal. Being hit by a legally thrown ball from the opponent's court before it hits the ground, wall, basket, goal, or curtain will result in a player being out. Any player or players contacted by a live ball in this manner shall be out. As you can see from the diagrams below, we can see an instance where the ball hits the floor first, then hits a player, and that player that was contacted is safe. However, if you look to the bottom right, you'll see where a player is contacted directly from a thrown ball, and that player is now out. A thrown ball that hits one opponent and then contacts another opponent before contacting the ground, wall, basket, or goal will result in the both opponents being eliminated. We can see here in the diagram below, the player standing up gets contacted first, the player crouched down then gets contacted by the ball prior to hitting the floor, wall, basket, or goal, and now both players will be out. When it comes to contact with the head, the rules vary just a little bit. If a ball is deemed to be deliberately thrown at an opponent's head, the thrower will be out and the hit player will be safe. If a player attempts to dodge a thrown ball and then the ball contacts the player in the head, the will be safe and the player that attempted to dodge the ball will be out. You can see the illustrations of these two different types of situations below. Here's some instances in which a thrower will be out. If a thrown ball that hits an opponent then is caught legally by another opponent before the ball contacts the ground, wall, basket, or goal, or curtain will result in the thrower being eliminated. It can happen in two different types of scenarios as illustrated below. As we had just mentioned, the ball is caught in the air by an opponent, the thrower is out. However, the plus side of this is that the catching player's team will be allowed to re-enter a player in the order in which the players were eliminated. Defensively, players may use the ball as a shield to shield themselves from a thrown ball. Using a ball as a shield to deflect an opponent's thrown ball is legal as long as the ball does not contact the player holding the ball, or in this case, the shield. If a thrown ball is blocked by a ball in possession of an opponent and the opponent's ball is dropped, the player is not eliminated. The ball must contact the player. If a thrown ball is blocked by a ball in possession of an opponent and the thrown ball is deflected into another player, the player who the ball contacted is out. If a thrown ball is blocked by a ball in possession of an opponent then caught by the non-throwing team, the thrower is out. We can see that first scenario that I brought forth there illustrated below. Other ways to get out include attempting and failing to catch a thrown ball provided that the player comes into contact with the thrown ball before it hits the ground, ceiling, walls, or basketball goal, intentionally kicking a ball in an attempt to hit an opponent, or once out, players must immediately leave the playing area, and in this case, this person would act as a temporary shield or not leave the playing area immediately. This would result in a teammate being eliminated. Scoring. When time expires, whichever team has won the most games wins the entire match. Stalling or five second violations. The trailing team must be given the opportunity to eliminate the leading team's players. 
There shall be no stalling by the leading team to keep the trailing team from this opportunity. The leading team may not collect and hold all the balls to keep them from the opposition. The officials will call a stall and begin a five-second count when no balls are at the disposal of the trailing team and no play has been made by the leading team. Before the end of the five-second count, a ball must be put at disposal of the trailing team by attacking, throwing, or rolling it to the other side of the court. Throwing a ball over and beyond the end line or sitting a ball over the end line would not be included. For five-second penalties, the first violation will be a stoppage of play and the ball is evenly divided between the two teams. Play begins again with all players on their respective baselines. For the second violation, a player from the violating team will be automatically eliminated. If for some reason a team wishes to protest rule interpretation or player eligibility, here are some guidelines that that team should be aware of. Individuals who wish to protest must do so at the time of the incident in question. Judgment calls are not subject to protest. The protesting team must notify the site supervisor to suspend play. The supervisor will then document the contest facts and file a report. Signed protest forms must be submitted to the Wellness Center the day following the contest in question. Southern Miss Intramurals reserves the right to investigate the eligibility of teams and players. These investigations may result in suspension, forfeiture, and probation. In order to keep games starting on time, Southern Miss Intramural Sports adopts a policy that game time is forfeit time. If teams know that they cannot make their scheduled match time, there are two options that that team has. One is to forfeit, and the other is to default. Teams that fail to have the required number of players present at the game site at the designated game time must forfeit the match. A forfeit results in a loss for the team, a sportsmanship rating of 2.0, a suspension of the team captain, and a fee of $15 assessed to that team captain. Once this fee is paid to the Payne Center sales desk, the forfeiting team's captain's suspension will be lifted. The better of these two options is to default. If a team informs the intramural office that they cannot make their scheduled game by noon, the day of their game, or even further in advance, the game will be defaulted and result in a loss for the defaulting team and a sportsmanship rating of 3.0. There are no fees associated with defaulting a game. Here is the sportsmanship scale for intramural sports. After each game, the officials and site supervisor will come together and determine the sportsmanship upon the behavior of that team during the game. Keep in mind, a team includes players, coaches, and fans. Examples of factors that could affect a team's sportsmanship rating may include team or player descent towards an official, unsportsmanlike conduct penalties or technical fouls, abusive language, excessive celebration, unruly fans, and so on. Teams must maintain a sportsmanship of 3.0 to be eligible for playoff competition. For a complete set of the rules, you can see those at www.usm.edu forward slash rec sports forward slash rules. You can also contact us at the information listed on the next slide. League information. Schedules and brackets will be posted to imleagues.com backslash USM. You can find these easily on your team page. Game times are based on the division you register for. For example, Mondays at 10 p.m. This means that you will play every Monday at 10 p.m. Be sure to check your email for updates. This will often be our primary source of communication between us and you. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. You can contact Sean Clark, Assistant Director of Intramurals and Club Sports, or David Calhoun, Graduate Assistant of Intramural and Club Sports. You can reach us at 601-266-5520 intramurals at usm.edu, or you can message us directly at imleagues.com. So what's next? By continuing on and completing the captain's quiz, you are now verifying that you have completed the online captain's meeting video and aware of all rules, policies, and procedures related to dodgeball. If you have any questions, please contact the intramural office through the information provided in the previous slide. You have now completed the online captain's meeting for intramural dodgeball. We wish you the best of luck in the upcoming season.